And there's many things in the Bible, in the prophecies, that are for our warning and admonition so that we can uh, heed the instruction there, so that we don't be caught unaware like Jesus said, I'm coming, don't be caught unaware like a thief in the night. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be like that. We want to give the message a certain sound and we want to tell people about the things that are going to take place shortly. So there are people who say to us sometimes, why do you guys spend so much time on prophecy? Why do you spend so much time on all this negative stuff? Well, it's not negative when you're trying to give a warning out of love to say, hey, watch out for these things, be careful. And it's actually our job to warn them, as God says, from him. They know you're not going to go for this, so we're going to give you our alternative for it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to look like they're fighting against us, but really we're just pushing everything back and forth, back and forth, working, working our way up. Welcome back, brothers and sisters, to a, another episode of Truth Matters. We've been gone for quite a while, with good reason, but we are so grateful to be back with you all. Uh, we're going to be covering a whole bunch of things over the next few episodes. Today we're going to start with Project 2025, but as we look at Project 2025, which is a uh, transition document for the upcoming presidential election in the States, we'll also look at Laudate Diem, which is the Laudato Si 2.0 document that came out, and some of what's happening in uh, Israel from the evangelical perspective to try to understand what the false prophet sees behind this whole thing. But before we get into that, Let's share some updates uh, that you might have for the audience. Yes, yeah, so we have, well, a couple things happened. We went to ASI. so Which was a blessing. Which was really nice. We got some really nice interviews there. Uh, you can go check them out on the YouTube channel under live. Then we had camp meeting. We also had, a blessing. Yes, we had a little, uh, well, around 400 people here, maybe a little bit over on Sabbath and had a lot of really good speakers. It was a very nice experience. Mm -hmm. And you can go see that right now on adtv.watch. And we'll be releasing the lectures on YouTube shortly. But I do want to mention that during the broadcast, we actually got shut down on YouTube because of uh, certain things. And so you need to go to adtv.watch for those episodes because we won't be able to even put them onto YouTube. So speaking of which, people need to be going to adtv.watch and amazingdiscoveries.org. Make yourself a login. Don't forget that. These podcasts, we go into a lot of detail. And on adtv.watch, you can create a login. You can do bookmarks and notes and then study through all the things that we're sharing so that doesn't just overwhelm you and you can actually see and break it down for yourself. I think people should be doing that no matter what. Uh, we haven't really shown those that functionality yet, like on this program, but maybe in the future we should show people what that really does. Because I think anybody who has the experience watching on YouTube and is actually interested in studying versus just like passive watching yep. uh, and goes and does the same thing at ADTV.watch, you will almost never go back to YouTube to watch our stuff again uh, because there's so much you can do with the information where YouTube's very static yep. and you get a lot of advertisements. And that's another thing that just happened. YouTube recently changed their policy. So ads are going to be on probably all of our videos at the start and even throughout the video. So if you want to avoid that, go to adtv.watch. And when you make a login, it'll actually walk you through the steps of how to use the bookmarks and the notes so you don't have to guess. And that makes that very easy. Mm. Another thing we want to share with you guys a resource that we have is our email lists. So Matt, do you want to tell us a little bit about the different email lists? Yeah, so there's three primary offerings uh, and you can, I find a lot of value out of the Daily Bible Verse 1. Uh, the Daily Bible Verse 1 is, is something that goes to their inbox every single day. It's got a Bible verse and an Ellen White commentary associated with it that really kind of opens up what the Bible verse is and, and kind of how we can uh, understand and see some of the perspective that maybe we couldn't before. And even as somebody who reads and studies and does this stuff all the time, I absolutely love getting that Bible verse first thing every day to kind of set your day off right. Yeah, It's free, 
you just go up, uh, sign up, uh, and please, and we'll put the link down in the description to go sign up and start getting those daily Bible verses, regardless of what denomination or what belief you are. If you want to familiarize yourself with the Bible, sign up for that. We also have a prophecy report newsletter, which has been going out for a couple years now, and it just kind of accumulates relevant news and information in one place, gives people like who don't have a ton of time to, to look at this stuff all the time, something that's condensed, offers some perspective, they can share it around. And then the last one, of course, is our events, things that are upcoming, new releases, will kind of keep you in the loop on what's upcoming. If you want upcoming. to come to camp meeting. Exactly. Get in the know earlier rather than having yep. your friends tell you about it and say, oh, how do I get involved with it? Sign up for the newsletter that's associated with the the events and, and you can get all that information. Yeah, and that is, I believe, welcome.amazingdiscoveries.org. Mm -hmm. And then also we have a magazine. And you maybe don't know about our magazine, but we've been producing a magazine for decades, mm. basically. And it's called Faith on the Line. There's a lot of great resources there. It comes out four times a year. Sometimes it's a double copy. And uh, you can get the digital or the physical version that we send to you. So that's another thing that everybody should take a look at as well. And mm -hmm. that's on the store. And you can go there and get the subscription to our magazine. Yeah, really, really great stuff in there each quarter. Yeah, the team does a good job of putting stuff together for that. So we will start with... Project 2025. Yes. Now, uh, I've done a couple sermons recently on this topic or around this topic, and I've come to find that either Adventists kind of know about this or they've never heard about it at all. And so hopefully what we can do is shed some light on it. Uh, I know some other ministries have touched on it, but really try to understand is like we've been advocating now for I don't know how many episodes, like here comes all this stuff happening in America, Satan appearing as Christ, miracles happening in the Protestant churches that gets everyone interested. Well, there's no uh, reason to stop looking at the false prophet now and seeing what's happening uh, with what's going on in the world and how that entity is viewing the flow of these events. And what is fascinating is they just came out it's a it's a 900 page plus document. It's not a short one. No. <laughs> not uh, like Laudato Diem. Right, Laudato Diem is only 18 some odd pages. Uh so a shorter document that's just kind of an add on to the uh Laudato Si encyclical from 2014. But what we're going to look at today is kind of diving into that and looking at the perspective on how maybe we're seeing a major macro Hegelian dialectic going on back and forth between left and right, between the ideologies of the globalists and the ideologies of the conservative religious right, and see maybe if we can decode uh, what we are actually looking at. So we've titled this one, Decoding Project 2025. And so we're going to try to understand the end time views and goals of the false prophet in understanding this Project 2025. But before we do that, we always like to try to set people off with Scripture to understand why we're even spending time talking about this stuff, and I'd like to walk through a couple of those Scriptures just to kind of frame the conversation. It says in Ezekiel 33, 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word out uh, at my mouth, and warn them from me. So God's actively telling Ezekiel here, and as a larger message to his people, to heed the warnings, and if we're supposed to be here to help people, to give them this warning. And the warning for our time, if you want to read Revelation 14, 9 through uh, 12, and I actually think it's just the end part here, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now, any true loving Christian doesn't even want their worst enemies to experience the full wrath of God. They rather have them be saved, just as God would rather have them be saved than to experience this. So there are people who say to us sometimes, why do you guys spend so much time on prophecy? Why do you spend so much time on all this negative stuff? Well, it's not negative when you're trying to give a warning out of love to say, hey, watch out for these things, be careful, and it's actually our job to warn them, as God says, from him. Or else we are watchmen that aren't approved. The Bible says you need to be watchmen that are approved. And if we don't say anything, what good's a watchman? If they're just watch, a watchman doesn't just watch things happen. Mm. It warns about things that it's watching for. 
And there's many things in the Bible, in the prophecies, that are for our warning and admonition so that we can uh, heed the instruction there, so that we don't be caught unaware like Jesus said, I'm coming, don't be caught unaware like a thief in the night. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be like that. We want to give the message a certain sound, and we want to tell people about the things that are going to take place shortly. And we're going to rush through uh, not spending too much time on some of these verses and quotes. Because we've be covered it. And we've covered it, and we have a lot of material to go through yeah. this next couple episodes here. Yeah. So in that same spirit, the voice of a true watchman needs now to be heard all along the line, for we are in the great day of the Lord's preparation. Yeah. Meaning, if we're not actively preparing now, there's going to come a time where there is no more time left to prepare. Yeah. And so this time, we're trying to do our best to share with people, as well as we understand, how to prepare for what's coming. You have to prepare before the crises, not during the crises. That's right. And in the end of the statement, it says that, you know, there, there's a job for the, for the watchman, too. We have to ourselves. It says they must be pure. They must be divested of self, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So we also have a job not just to say uh, what's happening, but to live in accordance and to go through the process of sanctification, growing closer to the Lord through faith in Christ. So it's not just a... Um, sound the cry, but don't live according to the message. We right. are also preparing ourselves, for our hearts and minds, for the soon return of Jesus. And in that, we've talked at, at length about the three primary powers that we see identified by the Bible, the dragon, who we know as Satan, the beast, it, in this context, is the papacy, and the false prophet, which we've covered as apostate Protestantism, American apostate Protestantism specifically, for those who are new to this, go watch some of our older episodes to catch up on how we can be yep. sure that these are the identities of those. We had whole episodes on the second beast, the lamb-like beast in mm -hmm. Revelation. You'll mm -hmm. see even on the thumbnail, it's a picture of a bison there. There you so go. You can go check out those episodes. And please do. Uh, now, one of the things that oftentimes we do is we focus on the, the papacy, but I have seen and we've looked at before why for right now, even more so American Protestantism is the one we're going to see yeah. doing the next couple of steps here before we get into the rest of the end time phases. And so I wanted to read this as just a reminder uh, why we're looking at uh, apostate Protestantism more so necessarily than the papacy as the primary power, even though it's still good to understand what, what the papal power is doing. Well, it's going to be rising its head again. Mm -hmm. It received a deadly wound, Yes, and it's in the process of healing. Mm -hmm. So once it's healed, then obviously it's going to be back in full front yes. on the picture. But in the time being, in Revelation 13, we're in that second beast there. Yeah, and it's the second beast's job to heal the wound. So that's why we're so focused on the Protestant yeah. aspect, is because we want to see them do what they're supposed to do to heal this wound. So if we'll look at this statement uh, from Ellen White that says, Then I saw the mother of harlots, that the mother was not the daughters, but separate and distinct from them. She has had her day, and it is in the past. past. And her daughters, the Protestant sects, were the next to come on the stage and act out yeah. the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints. Then it goes on to say, soon they will exercise the power once exercised by the mother. Exactly. So this also gives us a bit of a, a time frame. Is Protestants persecuting people the way that the mother did during the 1260 right now today? Not yet. Not yet. Is it in the process of happening? That's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're about. looking at. That's right. <laughs> but for people who are saying, well, yeah, the Protestants are... No, go back and look at what the church, yeah. what the mother did during that 1260. And that's almost how we can also see how close we're getting to some of the things that come after Protestantism. What what it really looks like yeah. is as Protestants become more persecuting, and just as the mother did, it's going to be done in the name of God. Yeah. And it'll look like, well, no, we're the good guys. We're justified for moral reasons to be able to do the same stuff. Well, it that that second beast is represented like a lamb, mm -hmm. so it looks Christ-like, mm -hmm. Protestant-like, but it will speak as a dragon. So it's going to have a different voice than what it looks like it should have, and like you said, it is going to do the same persecution that the papacy did mm -hmm. in, that, in the Dark Ages during the 1260 years, 538 to 1798, and why was it so dark? It was dark in several ways. Politically, it was dark. Religiously, it was dark. People couldn't read the Bible. 
they had to get that interpreted to them and they were forced to do religion in a certain specific way mm. and the state specifically was controlled by religion so all these aspects is what we're looking America to start doing. That's right. And 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 really accelerate now that we have seen so much other stuff accelerating yeah. at a high speed. And we have the Bible uh, to back this up, where it says that he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon, just like you mentioned. And it says in verse 12, in Revelation 13, 12, and he exercises all the power of the first beast. So there, again, matching what the statement, what we saw, this is supported by Scripture. And then once that deadly wound is healed, everyone worships the first beast. So another aspect that we want to just make sure our compass is on the right place is that uh, there are people all over the world now looking at different globalist organizations, World Economic Forum, UN, the papacy, whatever, yeah. and saying, oh, this is where everything's happening. But we see again, the, the, the second beast, the false prophet, same entity, has to do this stuff in America first, primarily. That's not saying yeah. other things can't be set up in other places. But for all this to go off in the way that... The Bible prophecy lays out, America has to do its job first. And we see in this statement, as America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor false Sabbath. The people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Yep. So it's kind of this concept where it happens America first, then the rest of the world, at least to the scale that we're looking for for end time events. Yep. And we see again... Uh, here, the Bible record in Revelation 13 supports this, where it says this American power will have great wonders and fire come down from heaven in the sight of men yep. and deceives them that dwell on earth by means of the miracles, which we covered at length in a few of those episodes. So what's going to change the game, so to speak, will be this miracle working power in the States. And it's at that time where there's enough religious support now that the image is made and it says, in, and then the dwell on earth, they should make an image. Uh, which had a uh, wound by the sword and did live. So again, this is being backed up by Scripture. And another one, just to kind of show the state of things, uh, you know, we're openly Adventists, we don't hide that fact, uh, but there are some who don't want to join Adventism because they look at it and say, oh, there's, there's problems in there or whatever. There are some in Adventism who are looking at these same problems and saying, maybe I should leave, and there are some that have actually left. And I just wanted to share this comment because just like Jerusalem or uh, uh, um, Israel, Israel, excuse me, back in the day had trouble staying in good graces with God because they were disobedient. At no point was there any other group of people in the world where you could find uh, the true God, yeah. the true Creator. And we're having the same issue now. The statement says Satan will work his miracles to deceive. She says will work, not has worked or is yep. working. And then it says he will set up his power as supreme. And so we're kind of matching that to Satan's appearing as Christ. Uh, miracles have been going off. Dead people seeming to come back to life. And it looks like his power is supreme. Then she writes what it looks like the church is doing in this state at this late stage. And it says the church may appear, appear as about to fall, but it does not. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. Yeah. So we have to realize the state that, that we're in, that even if this is the remnant church, it still is not uh, just a straight arrow uh, to God, that in fact, even this late in the game where Satan's come and done all this stuff, the church still looks like it's in bad shape. In fact, it may from today to then get progressively worse. Yeah. But that does not mean at and any will time get worse. it will. Because we're in this Laodicean Revelation chapter 3. It says we're in a Laodicean state, mm. which means that we think we're all good, but we're really destitute, to poor, blind, and naked, that we have forgotten to study our Bible. We've forgotten to get familiar with the prophecies that is telling us what is going to take place. We're getting lackadaisical. We're getting lazy. And the individuals do not constitute what is truth. The fact is that truth is truth, and what's in the Bible is truth. Mm. And so we will see people who are appearing like the church will fall because they are not following the council, they are not following the Bible scripture, 
but that does not denote that the message behind that movement is false. It doesn't just because you go to university doesn't mean you're going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. Maybe you went to school, maybe you failed, maybe this, and it's not the school's fault. It's the people's fault yeah. that don't continue. Yeah. And if everyone, every good uh, one of God's people left the remnant church, there'd be no one to give the warning calls. There'd be no one to point people in the right direction. And for people who say, well, the remnant church is just anybody who follows God with all their heart. Well, in no age has there never been a knowable, joinable entity yeah. for people to participate in as God's church. Uh, and so there is an identifiable entity that makes up God's remnant church. It has, and, and is joinable and is global. Um, so we wanted to just add that in there, and in fact, it, it says it gives a little more detail towards the second part there, where it says, none but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and the true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths. So we see here, like, the whole point is not only staying in, but overcoming not by our own efforts, but by true belief and faith in the blood of Christ yeah. as the atoning sacrifice for sin. And this is a reference to Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, talking about this group, this 144,000 group, that is going to have a special message that they're going to give. Mm -hmm. Now imagine everyone with this special message went and left, and, and there was no one to come in. When it says, yeah. come out of her, her my people, you got to come what? out into what? Yeah. <laughs> so it has to be a, a noble, joinable organization. And for those out there that are, are looking at Adventism and wondering the state of it, know that we already know this is the case, and that you're not following uh, a group of people in a church, you're following God, yeah. just like the ancient Israelites, yeah. uh, that you had to go there and, and, and find the true God. So hopefully that's an encouragement for people, knowing that we already know this has to occur in the state of things to get there. Now, in understanding s the structure by which Satan's going to go about uh, pulling this whole thing off and, and deceiving the whole world, Matthew 24.4, where Jesus basically says is the identifying characteristic of, of what we're going to be dealing with. He doesn't say, watch out for the evil guys coming to take this. He said, watch out that no man deceive you. Yeah. And so the deception aspect, we have to really hone in on what deception is, because so much of the world right now is looking square at the enemy. I'm looking at Klaus Schwab and Greta Thunberg over, uh -huh. your, <laughs> over your right shoulder here. And most of the world, evangelical, Protestant, secular, whatever, they're looking at World Health Organization, World Economic Forum, UN, these guys, these guys, Bill Gates, you know, the whole group of bad guys. You know, the thing is, deception's not that good unless it's subtle. If it's so obvious and outlandish and different than what you're looking for, it's going to be hard to deceive you. Mm -hmm. So it has to be very similar structurally what you're, what you think would almost be right mm -hmm. if you're not seeing exactly what the Bible's trying to say. And that's what we're going to see Project 2025 has done so subtly. Yeah. Because here we have most of the world seeing the bad guys coming straight at you, and it's the good guys behind them that are going to be the real ones that we're supposed to be watching out for. Yeah. And most of the world, because they see these bad guys coming straight at them in this whole system that they want to impose on the world, they're actually not only not going to see the, the real bad guy. They're going to advocate for the bad guy to to come in and yeah. that's a good deception mm -hmm. at that point. Now we're dealing with the real deception, not the yeah. not the bad guy that's coming straight at you. And Ephesians 4.14 gives us the kind of framework that Satan's going to use because we've talked about this at length. What Satan want more than anything? Your worship. That's exactly right. So in the temptations with with uh, when Satan was tempting Jesus, the very last one takes him up to the high mountain, says, I'll give you all this if you'll just fall down yeah. and worship me. So in all the myriad of things that the world and people are worried about, there's really only one thing that Satan wants out of the whole confusion and deception, and it's, it's the worship. He wants to be in the place of God. He wants to receive what is God's, and he wants the worship that God and Jesus received. Mm -hmm. And Ephesians 4.14 gives us the, the framework. It says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine. So he's going to use doctrine to confuse. The slight of men. So I say peer pressure here, because as we even saw with the health crisis stuff, yeah. talk about peer pressure. Now amplify the health crisis to 10, 50, 100 fold, and people are going to really 
be under pressure. So it's a, it's a, it's a well-stated thing by the Bible, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. So here I put illusions or mir- miracles as it may seem. Yeah. But the craft, the cunning craftiness, which is that of the serpent from all the way back in, in Eden, he's using these same types of elements in what's going to come in the end. So we see these kind of three elements are the pieces that get the whole world to end up being deceived and and following the worship of this system. Because he doesn't care if you choose to worship him or if you've been deceived into it or if you're just going along it through peer pressure. That's right. It it in Revelation 13 it says you can receive the mark in your hand or in your forehead. So that means in if you just comply with your works or your thoughts that you're actually consciously choosing that. Yeah. It doesn't matter to him. Yeah, and it's like the doctrine, whether you believe the doctrine, doesn't matter. Whether you believe the cunning craftiness of illusions, doesn't matter. Whether you're peer pressured, doesn't matter. So that's why this threefold element really all points to that one central worship point, because he doesn't care how you get there. Right. Where God does care. He wants it to be your free will choice out of love that you want to serve. Not coercion. That's right. Or force or any other... Uh, word that could be used other than out of free will love, a choice. Um, so that, now that we kind of have those that view on, now we're going to get a little closer to what's actually happening today. And we see that this image of the beast is the role of this false prophet. It has to do this job before the deadly wound can be healed and before the rest of the events can kind of play out. And it says, in order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. So if we're just taking all the descriptors that we have, we need to see a religious power in the United States, a Christian, Protestant-looking, because we see the mothers separate from the daughters. Like We actually have a ton of information here that the daughters are going to do what the mother did before, and so this religious power needs to be climbing to control the civil government. And what are we seeing today? Well, we've looked at the seven of nine Roman Catholic Supreme Court justices, including Chief Justice John Roberts, and it's very clear that their whole docket of cases is primarily focused on breaking down the wall separating church and state. It says in a series of recent rulings, the court has sided against policies based on the premise of, of secularism. So they're, they're really trying to tear down these walls. Yeah. And this is a, f- a fairly recent article from August... 13th, 2023, which says that the Supreme Court is taking a wrecking ball to the wall between church and state. And what's a wrecking ball do? It dismantles I and mean, destroys. just <laughs> demolishes everything. Yep. And so there's really two aspects to uh, church and state within the framework of the United States and how it's understood. You have the aspect, which is the funding of um, taxpayer money to go to religious schools. That's been off the table for many, many decades. Yep. Uh, and the second aspect is the coercion aspect, which is where things get really, really scary. Because if you remove the coercion clause, well, then you can arrest people for yep. not following these, these principles. And this is, is what the, what the uh, article says. It says, the establishment clause was long understood to re- re- require strict separation of church and state and specifically to forbid using public funds to pay for religious instructions. What does it say next? But those days are long past. So we're not even like, oh, it's just happened, you know, now money's going to schools. We're We're way past step one. So all we're left with is step two, which is coercion. And that says in the second part, that leaves the rule against coercion, which does still seem to have a little life. Just a little bit of life. Yeah. I imagine I, 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 those video games where you've got power meters and like you've got a full power meter and, mm-hmm. and the little bit of life, we're just like right down at the at the very, very end. The funny thing is most people when reading that would not think that. They would think, oh, we're long ways. There's no way that they could actually make religious enforcement laws across the government and that the church is in control and everything else. But we're seeing a very strong push, and people are going to see that this is not something that's far away. It's something that's right next door. 
and so much closer than they could ever realize because who's sitting around looking at the docket of Supreme Court cases and be like, oh, we're getting closer there. Oh, this is happening. They're so busy in their own lives yep. with the millions of things that they have going on in their own circumstances. And in part, that's Satan setting up snares to keep mm -hmm. us from spending time looking at this stuff. Let's continue. It says, even Gorsuch appears to concede, for example, that the government may not send the police to arrest someone who refuses to attend a Catholic Mass or find a Lutheran who refuses to convert to evangelical Christianity. What's kind of strange about that example is that's the exact type of thing that yep. I think we're going to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like Catholic Mass and evangelical Christianity, like these these aspects is the being... The fact that they bring it up mm -hmm. means that it is a thought. Yeah. Right? It's in the realm somewhere. Yeah. And those are the two examples. Both are being forced towards the things that we're actively warning about, yeah. which is Catholicism and specifically evangelical Protestantism. And we're going to cover about the blue laws, or at least reference the blue laws, which did just that. They put people in prison mm -hmm. for not worshiping the way that the state wanted. Mm -hmm. So the fact that that's on the books already... And then they're alluding to this again. They're talking about this separation of church and state taking a wrecking ball mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. We're going to go back to this state again. Yeah, and actually the third part of our Sabbath Sunday episode series, we are going to get to that third part. But it fits so well into understanding this first, understanding what's in this Project 2025 document, and then in a future episode, we're going to uh, really break down that Recovering the Sabbath Jesuit professor document about yeah. Sunday being a universal human right. Um, so people who are saying, wait, I thought you guys were going to do the third Sunday episode, we will get to it, we promise, uh, but it's going to tie in Other well. Other things came up in the meantime that we need to address first. Yeah, there's a couple things that have happened. So, you know, Gorsuch appears to concede that there's a little bit of life left in the in the upholding of the coercion yeah. rule. But I think it's pretty fair to say that they're working on getting rid of that completely. So this takes us to the subject for this episode and the next one. Project 2025. What is yeah. it? Let's read through. Project 2025 is a 900 plus page comprehensive guide on various aspects of the U.S. government and its functions. It involves a broad coalition of over 70 conservative organizations, that's important, the conservative organizations, mm -hmm. that come together aiming to prepare for and seize opportunities within the U.S. government in preparation for the, this is important, the transition to a conservative, religiously focused Republican government. The goal is to assemble a group of aligned, vetted, trained, and prepared conservatives to work from day one to deconstruct the administrative state, which is a.k.a. Joe Biden's government. And what have we been saying for the longest time? Everybody was wondering why we're saying this is going to come from the conservative side. Isn't the conservative side the good side? Yeah. Because, you know, we're against the liberal side and the far left. Yeah. But here we're seeing, okay, there's this 900-page document, and it's a U.S. government guide on its functions and how we're going to transition to a conservative, religiously focused Republican government. Mm -hmm. So a right, far-right government that's religiously focused. Mm -hmm. This is Revelation 13 to a T. To a T. I mean, this is exactly what we should, we should be expecting. And people ask, well, why Project 2025? Next year, 2024, is an election year in the States. We're going to yep. see our classic right versus left sludge fest of just throwing stuff uh, at people. And in 2025, there will be either a new president, the existing president uh, that is in his second term. Uh, one of those two things are, are going to happen. And so here we see that they're preparing for this, this transition to this new government. Now, when you go to their website, uh, here's, the, here's the front page. It says, building now for a conservative victory through policy, personnel, and training. Now, the policy aspect is going to be interesting because think tanks. We're going to look at think tanks in this episode, and we're going to look at think tanks and when we decode the, uh, the new financial system that's coming for no buy, no sell, because think tanks are playing a huge role in the policy creation and implementation that's going on in governments in the United States yep. and around the world. And we see from their homepage, it says, it's not enough for conservatives to win elections. If we are going to rescue the country... So here are our saviors. Yep. These are going to take us from those back, those leftist, globalist, bad guys that are coming right for us. And this will get even deeper in later episodes. 
because the people who are looking like the heroes are actually not the heroes in the story. Mm -hmm. But that's who's played as the hero. It's it's a thesis, antithesis, Hegelian dialectic game. Yes. That they're they know you're not gonna go for this. So we're gonna give you our alternative for it. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna look like they're fighting against us, but really we're just pushing everything back and forth, back and forth, working, working our way up. Yep. And left and right working for the same cause when you get to the yeah. the base of it. And we'll look at that a little bit more later. So it says, if we're going to rescue the country from the grip of the radical left, and that's the that's the moment we're in right now, yeah. the radical left, we need both a governing agenda and the right people in place. And then skip down, it says, this is the goal of the 2025 presidential transition project. So it's specifically focused on getting the right president in there. And we're going to look at yeah. maybe who their favorite person might be for this. I, and I just want to make a comment here on the participants. So on the next slide there, we show, you know, some of these people here. Mm -hmm. um, this 2025 project, it's not the government who put this Project 2025 out. Right. It's people who are pushing everything in a certain direction. And there's an agenda behind it. And all these agendas are like front organizations yep. for different things and we can see how this is playing into the whole game that's taking place here no doubt no doubt and in fact the reason we put this up is to show that it's not just like one group's idea or vision it's not like oh you know you could get 50 different groups put out 50 different documents and we just yep. grabbed this one no this is in fact maybe the most unified effort to christianize the government in the mm -hmm. modern era that all these groups are led by conservative religious people. You don't go in to the American conservative in the first uh, row here and find yeah. secular individuals. You're going to find religious people as the heads of each one of these. Now let's take a look at if this is a bus and you got all 70 people, who's driving the bus? Yeah, It's the Heritage Foundation. It's a group called the Heritage Foundation and they call themselves America's premier conservative think tank. So like these guys see themselves as high up within this hierarchy of think tanks, which there are hundreds in the United States and thousands around the world. And we've talked about think tanks before, like the Club of Rome. Yes. That's a think tank. Yes. And these think tanks are always the drivers. Yeah. They're the guys who are putting in the policies, who are driving, whether it's be social, economic, you have the Bilderbergs, you have all these different organizations that are the think tanks planning what's going to take place. And it almost looks like they can prophesy because they're just planning it out and they're just going according to plan. Yeah, that's a good way to make it look like you can predict the future uh, by planning it, yeah. strategizing so it actually comes out that way and then it looks like you're you know, prophetic in what you're doing. So the Heritage Foundation has been around since 1973. Every time we look at stuff, when we go deep diving, we always want to look at the source of where things came from. So like someone plucks a piece of fruit off the tree and hands it to you. I want to know where the what tree is it? Who planted the tree? What, what soil did they Yeah, what fertilizer <laughs> did they use? And really understand the fruit, yeah. how the fruit got to be what it is. What am I eating? What am I eating? What am I putting into my heart and mind from this stuff? And so we did the same thing here. And what we find is it started by three people, uh, Paul Weyrich, uh, Edwin Fulner, and Joseph Kors. And we're going to look at them in a second. But you see, even from 1973, and I don't know where we were in the Hegelian, I wasn't alive yet, where we were in the Hegelian back and forth at that point, whether it was conservative or liberal at that stage. But you can see it was established as a response to the perceived liberal bias in policymaking in academia. Yeah. So the whole goal of Heritage Foundation is to offset this liberal bias through policy. And policy is really important because if you were to make a future religious law, you're going to have to do that through policy. So these think tanks play actually a very significant role because policy is how much is how so much stuff gets enacted uh, when you're dealing with the types of things that we're talking about. Well, the interesting thing in 1973 was Richard Nixon, who was the president at the time. Mm -hmm. So all, all these things are put in place for an exact reason. And we can't discount any point of them. We don't have time to go into everything, but we're going to skip through now looking at a little bit more detail about these guys. Yeah, so it's just to see who the three founders are, not no judgment, just want to know. 
And what we see is Weyrich was a Catholic, and he was really well known for uh, mobilizing the religious right and was instrumental in the formation of the, quote, moral majority, a political organization that sought to advance conservative Christian values. Now, he's a Catholic. Who, how does he define Christian values? Through Catholicism. Through Catholic social teaching. How yeah. does he define moral through Catholic, Catholic social, social teaching. teaching. So as you're looking at this, you can't just take it on your face like, oh, I'm a Christian. They must be the same values as I have. Yeah. You better look at how those two differ. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a Protestant and a Catholic. They would just be one. Yeah. So the values have to be different. But and they, Catholicism, we've talked about this before, says that they come before your local government because they are a kingdom in itself. Mm -hmm. So you have to have allegiance to them first. So when we look at the people involved there, and these are high people. These aren't just, you know, I, I go to church on Christmas, you know, kind of people. Their full allegiance has to be to the mother organization. Yes. And so all the policies they enact is going to have to go through that filter. Yes. And that's always been the challenge with Roman Catholics and foreign government positions of power because just by their very membership in the Roman Catholic Church, they automatically, if they're practicing, they're automatically confessing to a, a man, yep. which can be seen immediately. Imagine you know, a whole bunch of uh, Chinese uh, foreign government officials, and you're confessing all this stuff to them. People would have a problem with that. If yep. you were in a president, well, in this case, the president of the United States is confessing to his, uh, his priest. Um, that these are these have been issues for Protestants for a long time, and now a lot of people just don't care, and honestly think that we're like being bad guys or being judgmental because we have problems with this still. Yep. But if you just look at it for what it is, anybody should have a, have a problem with this. Edward Fulner, same thing, trained and educated in Jesuit schooling, devout Roman Catholic, and then Joseph Kors, and now here's where you get the the bleeding of the Catholicism with evangel evangelical yep. Christianity. He was a conservative evangelical Christian, and Kors believed in the importance of traditional values and was committed to advancing policies that he believed would strengthen families and communities. That word traditional is going to keep coming it up is. over and over. It is. It is the great unifier yep. amongst religious schools of thought who are all conservative. And a good example of this is the new prime minister of Italy, a woman named Maloney. I can't remember her first name. But she came out of a very strong left-wing environment, and she's an ultra-right-wing conservative. Mm -hmm. She doesn't say whether she's Catholic or not, but if you're the prime minister of Italy and say you're a Christian, you're, most, you're mo probably not a most Protestant. Likely. You're probably a Catholic. But when you look at what she campaigned on, she campaigned on traditional values, getting family, it would sound like an evangelical Protestant campaign, so to speak. And here she is in the belly of the beast, so to speak, in Italy, uh, now representing this far right wing. I think New Zealand just had this shift towards right wing. I think Australia actually recently just had this shift towards right wing. So the pendulum swinging, yep. and they're all talking along the same lines, and we're going to look at that here soon. So and that word traditional inside of it is tradition mm -hmm. which is the main driver in the Catholic, uh, roman catholicism yeah. they say that tradition overrides the bible yeah. and their tradition as the catholic church can rewrite we, we went over this at length that they can go against the bible at any aspect they can change the day of rest they can do this they can make these changes mm -hmm. and so when we're talking about traditional values this doesn't mean biblical values. That's why it doesn't say biblical values. It says traditional That's values. Right. And I just want to point that out so yeah. people don't get confused that it's not their, you know, mom and pops and their grandfather's values, you know, Christian values. No, these aren't biblical values. This is a different thing. This is a code word that they're using. And actually, I think the Reformation, the whole thing stood on sola scriptura versus scripture and tradition. tradition. So it's like this is kind of its ugly head popping back yeah. up. It's not a sola scriptura based thing. But we see Catholics and evangelicals coming together on Project 2025. Uh, that's going to be really interesting as we look at the Hegelian aspect of what we're yeah. dealing with here. Now, those were the founders in 73. What if it's different today? Well, this is the current head of um, the Heritage Foundation. His name's Kevin Roberts, and he's a Roman Catholic. The person before him was a evangelical Protestant. 
So they kind of switch off, but the the organization represents both of those two yeah. schools of thought. Now listen to what Kevin Roberts has to say. Can you tell us what Legatus has meant for you and Michelle? It's not only great networking, but a reinforcement of our Catholic values. And from that reinforcement, courage. And I think that's one of the things that, whether it's in chapter meetings or the annual summit, or equally importantly, the friendships that we have developed, just the courage, especially with the way politics and culture and society are, for us to go through that, to confront those challenges and to be cheerful about it. Okay, so this is for Legatus. This is different than Project 2025, but this is the head of that Heritage Foundation organization saying whose values does he want to put back in? Yeah. Catholic values. So as a guy who's the president of a group making policy, where's his head at in the worldview space? Roman Catholicism. Catholic values. Catholic values, Catholic social teaching. And this is important because I don't think there's anyone alive that can have their worldview completely separated from the work that they put out. Well... The fact that you have Catholics and Protestants in this document, the driving force is going to be Catholicism because they don't change, and they say they don't change, right? Protestantism has shifted a lot, and it's shifting back to uh, its foundation, which is back at the Mother Church, which is Roman Catholicism, mm -hmm. because that's the ruling church that was going through the whole Dark Ages. And then... The reformers started to say, hey, we have an issue with some of the things here going away, and now we're kind of just on a drift back into where we started again. Yeah, and we see now that this Kevin Roberts from Heritage Foundation is saying that uh, while we're in the midst of probably the most hardcore globalist-looking push that I've ever seen in my life, yep. he says that the golden era of American conservatism will soon emerge. So like a phoenix rising from the ashes, so yeah. to speak. Now, the golden era. Think about the 20s, 30s, 40s. That was like hyper-conservative mm -hmm. American values. And the golden era is coming in the future? Yeah. That is, that's interesting. What's he, golden about it? Yeah, well, <laughs> to them, maybe something. It says uh, here, it says, the prescription on how the conservative movement led by organizations like Heritage can emerge from a turbulent time, even stronger in imposition, to take back the country from the radical left. Yep. So again, here we see on the homepage of Project 2025, save the country from the radical left. The guy driving the bus, save the country from the radical yep. left. But if history is our guide, then we have every reason to believe that the golden era of American conservatism will soon emerge. And I think we will agree with that statement, yep. that there will be this emergence of hyper-conservative religious yep. movement in the States. So... Back to the document. I find it very interesting because we now see that the uh, Heritage Foundation is the most preeminent conservative think tank. It was founded by Catholics and evangelicals. It's run by a Catholic today. So you think the Catholic Church and the, the Catholic uh, people putting this out would have the same agenda, the same view, but when we peek inside this document, we find the exact opposite. It says inside on page 48, this office should have been engaged early and often in using government contracts to push back against woke policies in corporate America. Mm -hmm. Now, the woke, you can just put that in with lib hyper liberalism, uber liberalism. And that's what we're seeing through, you know, gender ideologies and globalization and all of these things is all part of this woke agenda for those who don't know that term. But they're saying we're going to get rid of these woke agendas. And I think what we're seeing here today is the maybe the largest Hegelian pushback and maybe the final one, because when this conservative movement comes back in, I'm not sure it's going back towards liber liberalism again. I don't know for sure. Only God, God knows. But based on the sequence of events that we've talked about at length, we're really looking for this false prophet to come up. We're very close to the final events that are supposed to transpire. And this, the comparisons here that you put together on the slide the left versus the right is really interesting because going in this document, they say they're against the woke. They say they're against the far left. They say they're against the globalist and all these things. But we'll see the end goal is exactly the same as what the globalist and the left and mm -hmm. the everything wants. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no difference. Right. It's just words. Yep. 
and, and, and like auxiliary pieces that they don't really care about, but they, they really amplify. And then the things that they do care about, they yeah. hardly talk about at all. So here we're seeing now, just to familiarize people, what Hegelian dialectic is. It's basically taking two opposing ideologies, sending them out into the world, pushing them up against each other to create a synthesis yeah. ideology, just for people who don't know. Now what we're seeing is the liberal left versus conservative right which is communism, which I think anybody who looks at, you know, the whole World Economic Forum, even the papacy, the Pope being from South America, I mean, it's, it's everything coming out of his mouth is, a, is, is yeah. communism. Well, uh, it's, it's Catholic social teaching. It's, it's a socialist, communist type. Regime. Exactly, exactly. Everything against what America, Bill of Rights, yeah. all of that stuff. And then on the other side, I have communism versus democracy, but it's the democracy of this version of it, yeah. not the real one. The not woke, republicanism. Correct. Not true republicanism. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Protestantism, true Protestantism. And then the woke versus, which is hyper-liberal versus hyper-traditional. Yeah. Then you have anti-God versus forced God. Mm -hmm. So I think where people get mixed up is they say, because the anti-God is there, then we must have the right because at least they have God. Yeah. But we find... What God. Yeah, what God, number one, and two, uh, if it's the same God that was being forced on people for 1260 years as the Dark Ages. That's well, not really the God we want. No, us. that's not. <laughs> that's that's That leads to terrible circumstances. Yep. I mean, they invented all sorts of devices to hurt people and to, to submission yep. during those ages. So forced God is not better than anti-God. Right. It's just different, and in fact, we may even see that it's it's worse somehow this, but this is when you're dealing with the devil. Both sides are bad. And then finally, globalism versus nationalism. And just to make this more tangible for people, we've got groups like the World Economic Forum, United Nations, events like COP27 and the, yeah. the upcoming one. That would all fall in the, the left category. And in the right, I just put a couple in the National Association of Evangelicals, the Heritage Foundation, but we could list hundreds more under that. But just to give people an idea. And now, that's a, a great example of the deception of the devil's doing. Because he gives you one side, that's not good. And then he gives you the other side, that's not good. Mm -hmm. And so he leaves you with only his choices, or at least that's what he wants you to think. That's what is, that you have to choose between one yeah. and the other. And we see that now, like even with the, the stuff happening overseas, like people want you to be forced into choosing to support it or be against yep. it. And you can just be in no good situation there based on what the truth of the reality is. So let's switch gears here a little bit, because at the same time this Project 2025 document came out, Laude DM came out, Laudato C 2.0, and it came out October 1st. And what I want to do is just peek inside of that document so we can see how this left-right battle is happening right now, coming from the same power speaking out yeah. of two sides of its mouth. It says, let us unite with our Christian brothers and sisters in the commitment to care for creation. Mm -hmm. So it's very... Uh, Typical language from Francis on these things. We must side with the victims of environmental and climate injustice. Now, there is injustice, but the injustice is against God, not against the climate. It's our sin against God and, and transgression rather than the injustice of, of the climate. So you see that the creation is there. Oh, okay, we're, we're good there. And then shift it to something else. So very subtle. And I just want to make a side comment. And it's not that we agree with everything that people are doing to the planet that's harmful. That's correct. We don't agree with that. No. But they're taking an issue, and their solution is not the solution that God would have. Mm -hmm. God's solution was we need to have our homes in the country. We need to live off the land. We need to work with creation. Mm -hmm. Humanity's not the problem. Humanity was put in the Garden of Eden to tend and care for it, to make it better. Yeah. And the sort of the um, world elite view is pushing this idea that we are the problem. Yes. Humanity is actually the problem. Yep. And we're going to see a little bit more where that came from. Now, he says, working to put an end to the senseless war against our common home. Again, this mm -hmm. is supposed to make us feel like we're all in this together. Common home and common good yeah. are clever terms for saying get rid of individual rights, yep. liberties, privacies, because common good and the Bill of Rights those are like they's like oil and water. Yep. They cannot mix. And so he says all this fancy stuff to make it sound good. And then when you peek inside of this 18-page document, 
I would have to venture to say it's maybe one of the most scientific documents that's ever been put out by the Holy See. Mm -hmm. Because if you go back in different ages, you'll see all sorts of religious viewpoints, social doctrine, all in relation to sin and the afterlife. And But this is all about temperatures yeah. and degrees and climates. Let's take a look. It says, uh, we know that every time, we know, says so this is a statement of fact, that every time the global temperature increases by half a degree Celsius, the intensity and frequency of great rains and floods increase. I don't know if that's a fact or not. And even if it is, I always like to pose the question, the kind of general consensus is that we went through an ice age and that we're coming out of the ice age. So who's to even say that it shouldn't be different than what it is right now? Yeah. So that's there's a no whole agreed, other thing. Yeah, but. it is. <laughs> but there's no agreed cons consensus on these things, right. even though they like to make us think that there is. There's a lot of pushback. But it continues. It says the Paris Agreement presents a broad and ambitious objective. It says to keep the increase of average global temperature to under 2 degrees Celsius with the respect to pre-industrial levels. I, I'm not going to get into why the pre-industrial mm -hmm. level thing doesn't make any sense, because of course as you industrialize something, you're going to have more output that would affect the uh, the, the carbon, as they say. Um, and with the aim of decreasing them to 1.5 degrees, work is still underway to consolidate concrete procedures for monitoring. So now they yep. want to monitor the entire Control. world. And we're going to look at this in the no buy, no sell one, where we get into blockchain and how all this stuff is mm -hmm. going to be used to, to implement some of these things before the religious... And we felt a little bit with the carbon tax already, yep. this kind of initiative being yes. put forth, but that's going to go into hyper mode. It absolutely is, or at least it seems like it's going that way. Now, I want to just quickly say the ranges of one and a half degrees and this two degrees and half degrees, what this is doing is it, it creates this artificial threshold that gives an illusion that there's some kind of standard. Yeah. And that this standard, we got to give up everything to meet this magical standard that they yeah. made up. But the standard is arbitrary and irrelevant in the greater scheme of things. It's simply just a means to control individuals and businesses to adhere to basically impossible sustainable goals. And that today we're seeing in the form of, let's say, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we'll look maybe another time at how carbon is such a clever mechanism to, to build this control in. But as we kind of go through what Laude Diem is about, we see that, you know, whether it's Biden or John Kerry, these are powerful Roman Catholics in high positions of government, and Kerry was put as the head of the U.S. climate envoy team. Now, talk about a guy who really likes his pope. He's visited with the Vatic uh, with this pope at the Vatican, at the Vatican, four times as he's going through getting his, I'm assuming, his climate instructions yeah. and his, his agenda directly from the Pope, because we just read what just came out on October 4th, which is very recent. Mm -hmm. Now, look and see if you could hear the same language that Kerry's using as that we found in, in that document. Emissions from the food system alone are projected to cause another half a degree of warming by mid-century on the current course that we are today. And instead of being on a course to be able to hold the Durst temperature increase to 1.5 degrees, we're actually on a course to hit around 3 degrees right now. And you just can't continue to both warm the planet while also expecting to feed it. it doesn't work. And as is so often the case with respect to the climate crisis, we have to fight on multiple fronts simultaneously. This is the biggest organizational effort that I think we have faced, um, certainly since World War II, but perhaps ever. So we have to reduce emissions from the food system to keep the 1.5 degrees alive. Why do we have to keep 1.5 degrees alive? Because scientists, as a basis of physics and mathematics, not ideology and politics or party labels or anything else. As a matter of physics and mathematics and some biology and chemistry have told us, these are the consequences. So, yeah, we, we see the exact same numbers, 0. 0.5, 1.5. One and a half degrees. Yeah. And did you hear, like, the biggest problem is growing food for people. We can't possibly keep growing food for people. In fact, we have to sacrifice food production in order to keep the things yeah. at, at this existing level. And what do we see with the Norwegian uh, farmers? 
Mm -hmm. They they stopped letting them use fertilizer. Canada's yep. on the brink of doing some of this yep. stuff. In fact, I read an article that says Canada's 20 years ahead in their climate push than America. Wow. So, like, they are really far down the line. But did Kerry get his script directly from this document? Like, it, it, it seems like they're saying the exact same things. You know, he said, we're getting our information from uh, mathematics, from... but. And a little biology, and a little—you know—that the, actually the most important sectors of feeding the planet, which would be biology, is the one that we're not using the most. If we look at the whole population of the world today, and you can do this, you can Google this. If you add it up, eight billion people—we're a little over eight billion people now. We can have that population in a state smaller than Texas at the at the population density of France. So, or population density of Paris, I should say. And that's not the most dense city in the world. If we want to go even higher density, we can fit them in a tiny little area. And then the rest of the planet can really be for food. Right now, we have more than enough food growth area to feed more than 8 billion people. Yeah. If you look at just the t statistics of how much food waste is in America, the amount of percentage that's grown and then wasted, it's huge. And the amount that we put into animals to then become a hamburger is a huge number again. So just by becoming slightly more efficient, less wasteful, and you can feed much more people than we have today. So this is something that's not even scientifically yeah. accurate. Yeah, they love throwing the science thing around. We saw that during the, the health crisis. Like they, they, they just like create this idea that there's this wonderful, you know, uh, synthesis and, and uh, consensus amongst all people that this yeah. is the case. And it's like, it's like the adage, if you just keep repeating something long enough and loud enough, more and more people will believe it. And we, we did a whole episode talking about coming food crises. Mm -hmm. And we're still going to see this coming more and more in effect. And it takes a while for that wave to kind of become the tsunami. Yeah. But as they're saying, like we see in Europe, certain countries saying you're not allowed to use fertilizer. You're not allowed to do this. It has to be all organic. And that sounds great. But again, this is going back to the the Hegelian dialectic, let's push against each other, bad, good, bad, good, and come up with our synthesis. So first we're going to introduce Monsanto, first we're going to introduce Bayer, first we're going to introduce all these chemical companies, these GMOs, everything else, we're going to kill your soil, we're going to kill the biology, we're going to t kill everything, so that you have to be subservient on this. There was a documentary that came out, I think it was it's called something to the effect of um, no farmers, no food, something like this. The one issue with the documentary is the conclusion is we need chemical fertilizer, which I think both of us disagree with. Mm -hmm. There is a very good and natural way to do this. We talk about this on other videos at Amazing Discoveries. And actually, we should mention, we have a channel called How to Country, and we talk all about, like, homesteading type application, country living, growing your own food. Mm. There's plenty of natural ways to do this, but that's what they do. They give you this evil and then they say, oh, let's go organic. But now your soil is so dead that if you don't add anything to it, not that you can't fix it over time regeneratively. It just takes time and but money. But it takes time, takes effort, takes knowledge. Yeah. And that knowledge is removed. Yeah. And that's how they do it. They they implement these things in a process, and then oh, we don't know how to do anything you know properly anymore. Mm -hmm. That's not destructive, and then the whole food structure can just collapse right there. And so you have this crisis that they are in effect just creating. Yes, and that's where we stand today in this leftist ideology. Is it's just the the fact of the matter is that they have created this standard and killed the soils and, you know, going through this whole process and looking at what the results are of this uber left agenda and the food growing process being totally um, manipulated, yep. that we are now kind of seeing that people are, are realizing this, but almost too late, like how many people know how to 
right? remineralize their soils yeah. and things like that. So the main narrative behind this climate change is that it's human's fault. It's our fault. We're carbon emitters. It's human activity. It says here in Laude Diem, the unusual rapidity of dangerous climate change changes is attributed to unchecked human intervention on nature in the past two centuries. This is very clear what they're saying is the problem. Jumps down, it says, these changes are attributed to the global imbalance causing the planet's warming. Mm -hmm. So it, it's us. And now we need to control absolutely everything about our daily lives, activities, what we buy, what we do, how long we drive, everything yep. now has a nice framework to be surveilled and manipulated. And we'll look more at this in the in the no buy, no sell. But this, this document came out October 4th, 2023. And I want to show our audience something from 1991 mm -hmm. from one of those famous think tanks, the Club of Rome, which sits in Switzerland today, oddly enough, but was in Rome for a long time. And I think people, I wanted to share this with people because I don't think they realize how long a plan this has been and how clear of an agenda this is. Because when you see this statement, uh, and we looked at that document from 2023, and this is 1991, that we're looking at over you know 30 years of uh, information that has led up to what we saw in that document. Yep. So let's see what this, in the, from the book, The First Global Revolution, a report by the Council of the Club of Rome. It says, in searching for a new enemy, so they're searching for a new enemy to do what? To unite us. Unite people. Unite us. We, the Club of Rome, came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming. Now, how many people were talking about global warming in 1991? Basically no one. Almost no one. Okay. So here's the Club of Rome saying the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. Yep. So the think tank's doing its job. They get together. Well, what could we do here? Yep. And they've come up with essentially climate change in 1991. Yep. In their totality and in their interactions, these phenomena do constitute a common threat for mm -hmm. our common home, for that common good. So you see the same type yep. of thing, which demands the solidarity of, of all, all people. peoples. And this is the narrative that they're saying. Everybody's got to get on board to save the planet. How could you be against not saving the planet? Yeah. So, and this is, we can see the progression here. Like in the early 90s, they're coming out with this idea. And then later in the 90s, early 2000s, what do we see? We see the documentary on the penguins and on the polar bears. And then we have Al that Gore famous shot where it's pulling away from the polar bear and he's in the middle of the water swimming. And it's like, oh, there's no ice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's no, all the proper information is removed and you have no context and it's this shock factor and they're like, yes, we got them. Yeah. Oh, the polar bears, the poor polar bears yep. need ice to yep. survive. Yeah. They really play on the heartstrings and it's unfortunate because there are people who care. And I'm not saying that those people who care about our planet are, are no. you know, bad people or anything. The, the, the so. terrible thing is that, you know, just to talk about the polar bears, they don't take ice to survive. The, pol the level of polar bears today is higher than it was 20 years ago. With less ice, whatever you mm -hmm. want to say, the levels are going up. Yeah. And so they don't show polar bears for that anymore because, well, it's kind of obvious that there's more polar bears than there ever has oh, yeah. been. Oh, yeah. But they have been having this agenda. And, and that's why we said again, they plan it. Yeah. Right? It's just going according to plan. They get the think tanks involved. They come up with a nice plan, put it all, execution, done. Yeah, and we'll see a, a graph uh, in another episode of how the papacy has its tentacles in enough private corporations, think tanks, academia, mm -hmm. to infuse all the ideas that they'd want into the world so Protestants and whoever is secularists can all It's an amazing adopt. system. It's, it's, it's one that only the devil, I think, could, could arrange and set up. So it continues. It says, but in designating them as the enemy, we fall into the trap about which we have already warned, naming mistakenly symptoms for causes. All these dangers are caused by human intervention. So that's exactly what Kerry just said. Yep. And it is only through changed attitudes and behaviors that they can be overcome. The real enemy then is humanity itself. Yeah. From 1991, looking at the document that just came out, I mean, the, it's just too much to be coincidence. And what's particularly interesting is that 
everything we're seeing now, if you want to not have it be a Catholic agenda, well, here it is in your you know, secular government form yep. known as the Sustainable Development Goals. And I said earlier, it's kind of setting us up for failure uh, in the fact that it's like, get rid of all your prosperity, all your well-being, get rid of your heating and your stoves, everything in an effort mm -hmm. to, to make this happen. And they set us up for failure by saying, we can't stop until there is zero poverty and zero hunger. And yep. I've used this example before, but Jesus said the poor will be with you always. always. So here we're fighting against two principles. Get mm -hmm. rid of all poor, and the poor will be with you always mixes like oil and water. It just yeah. doesn't. And so as you look at what this really does, is it doesn't help a bunch of people from the bottom. It just makes everybody, because you can never achieve that goal, that you just keep adding taxes and penalties and you know legislation. More oppression, more oppression, more control and censorship and everything And you else. say, look, we haven't hit our arbitrary standard yet. We got to keep going. Yeah. There's still hungry people out there. We got to keep going. Yeah. And it's just a, it's a total setup for failure. So here's the bad guy coming right at us. I want to show now, we've just looked, we started at Project 2025. We now skipped over to Laude Diem. Now let's go back to Project 2025 and see what it has to say about this because this becomes really eye-opening. It says... The next conservative administ administration should rescind all climate policies from its foreign aid programs, should shut down the agency's offices, programs, and directives designed to advance the Paris Climate Agreement. Sounds nice. Uh, when you read this <laughs> and you look at the bad guy coming right at you, what's your initial reaction? I support these guys. Yeah. This is Hegelianism mm -hmm. because the, the Heritage Foundation and like many other of the 70 organizations, they're led by Roman Catholics. So here you have a pope and a Roman Catholic uh, American official going out and pounding the table as recently as October 4th for this whole climate change thing. Yeah. And just at the same time, a document's released saying, we're going to get rid of all of this stuff. Yeah. Again, it says on page 257, the agency should cease collaborating with and funding progressive foundations, corporations, international institutions, and NGOs, non-governmental organizations that advocate on behalf of climate fanaticism. Mm -hmm. So now they're even, again, you read this as somebody like us who doesn't want this all this stuff to happen. You say, yeah, get yeah. rid of this climate fanat fanaticism. I'm glad you actually went that length to call mm -hmm. it what it is. It is climate fanaticism. Yeah. And here, this, this document is pulling you in with its support, right? Again, it says, finally, the administration will face a significant challenge in unwinding policies and procedures that are used to advance, check this out, radical gender, racial, and equity initiatives under the banner of science. And what was <laughs> Carrie up there just doing? Pounding the table about science, yeah. science, science. And here, 2025 says, no, we're going to unwind all these policies. It says the Biden administration's climate fanaticism will need a whole of government unwinding. I mean, that's about as far opposite in the direction as we just saw from Laude yeah. Diem as we could possibly imagine. It goes on, it says, the federal government's resources to further the woke agenda should be reversed and scrubbed from all policy manuals. It's, as the final two words say, it's their top priority. Yeah. So now they're not only going to like undo it, they're going to scrub it as if it, if it never came up yep. at all. So you see here, hopefully this people are starting to see. idea. Yeah. And, and that this whole, that we're going to save you from the leftist, liberal, globalist bad guys. Yeah. We're going to save you from this climate change agenda. They even take an anti-World Health Organization stance in this whole thing. The Pope during the whole crisis was very World Health Organization supporting. But here again, even a Roman Catholic, even if it's mixed with Protestantism, it's, it's like two Catholics speaking against each mm -hmm. other. Here, it says the manifest failure and corruption of the World Health Organization during the COVID-19 pandemic is an example of the danger that international organizations pose to U.S. citizens and, and an interests. How many evangelicals read this and they're like, exactly. How many Protestants and secular uh, individuals read this and they're like, finally somebody gets it. Yep. And it says at the very bottom line, the next administration must end blind support for international organizations. Here's the last one on this piece. It says, for example, the WHO was and remains willing to support the suppression of basic human rights, particularly because of its close relationship with human rights abusers like PRC. That's the People's Republic of China. And so the, the, the document is essentially going against what the papacy yep. and parts of the U.S. government are saying. And looks like it's in support of 
individual human rights. Yes, it looks like that. And so this is where Hegelianism, I mean, this is ultimate Hegelianism that we're talking about. And when you go through the document and really start to line up where they're against, you can see they are against each other in some places, but in the most important areas, they are perfectly aligned. So we'll quickly review that communism is going up against this conservative revival. Uh, Then we see that one says climate change, one says no climate change. One says, yes, World Economic Forum, uh, World Health Organization, one says no. But when it comes to the moving the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, when it comes to support for Israel in the form of the third temple, and when it comes to Sabbath and Sunday rest, we see that the organizations are in complete harmony with each other. Right. And this is maybe the most dangerous thing about the whole thing, is because now you're getting riled up for the two places where they're yeah. and, and agree, uh, against each other, and like, yeah, so Project 2025 must be the good guys, but now we're going to take a look at how they're similar and why that's more important than any of the climate change stuff anyway, in terms of yeah. what the devil wants, your worship, our worship, everybody's worship. Now, the false prophet wants to unite church and state. They want government back in, uh, they want God back in government and in life, and they want to rebuild this third temple in Jerusalem. This, they view it as needed to happen in order for Jesus to come back. So, I mean, if I believe this too, I'd, I'd want the third temple to be rebuilt and all this stuff. And so when we look at the flow of events, when Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and moved the embassy there, it was maybe a bigger moment than most people would yeah. realize. And this, the, the declaration happened in 17, and they didn't move to, uh, to a temporary location until 2018. And it says here, President Trump on Wednesday formally recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, reversing nearly seven decades of American foreign policy and setting in motion a plan to move the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to the fiercely contested holy city, which is Jerusalem. Now, this character Trump, he has Protestant and evangelical supporters that are just, they're treating him like a Messiah figure. And we see this because there's even articles written about who had it worse. Trump Mm -hmm. during his persecution or Jesus Christ says in MAGA world and Christian nationalism circles, many Trump supporters see his eminent arrest as eerily similar to the crucifixion of Jesus. In this picture, people see it, oh, it must be Jesus supporting him in his time of trouble. No, it's comparing Trump to Jesus in the persecution that they felt. When they were on trial. Which is a ridiculous notion, but this is just to see what the false prophet, how they're viewing everything that's happening. And so we see that this narrative is coming. Uh, We're going to look, as we kind of close this episode here, in the next episode, we're going to look at the significance of moving that embassy to to Jerusalem. We're going to look at how the false prophet sees the flow of events in the end of time, and why the new house speaker that just got uh, uh, voted in in the United States, a guy named Mike Johnson, is incredibly relevant to if we're expecting to see a religious conservative power, Protestant power rise up, how significant it really is. The things that are taking place right now are just incredible. All the topics we've been talking about in the past is really coming to culmination right now. Mm -hmm. And it's not because we know anything, it's because the Bible is very clear. And if we study to show ourselves approved, then we will see these things before they happen so that we can be ready. Like you said uh, on one of the earlier slides, the preparation time. We need to be prepared for the events that are soon to come Mm -hmm. onto this earth. Mm -hmm. And as we do that, we need uh, our brothers and sisters to understand that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right. but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're not condemning Protestants. We're not condemning evangelicals. We're not condemning Catholics. We're asking those individuals in those things to open their Bibles, study the scriptures through the view of comparing line upon line, here a little, there a little, and not going to preachers or pastors to just assume that they know what they're talking about. Because we're not battling against individuals, we're battling against the principles 
which is either Satan's government or God's government. Yeah. And they, the, the two principles do not mix. And in fact, there is a, a documentary that is out. It's kind of hard to find. It's called uh, Praying for Armageddon. And in that, it shows a militarized Christian nationalist American group of Christians who are getting their guns, their uh, swords, all of these things ready for a, a, ba a real battle. Yep. Saying that the Bible has says, get get your swords ready. So I want to show our viewers how the Bible defines as getting ready for this battle and, and the weapons that we have at our disposal. It says, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. So your loins are girt with truth and the breastplate of righteousness. So it's not asking you to put on armor. It's asking you to put on truth and righteousness. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that your shield of faith. Mm -hmm. that you have the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Yep. People who think that you're grabbing a literal sword, and you have, if you have people in your life telling you you need actual weapons, he that lives by the sword does what? Dies by the he sword. He dies by the sword. The sword they're asking you to pick up is the Word of God. It's yep. the same Spirit as the Reformation that says, show to me my error from the Scriptures, and I'll change my position. Yep. But if it's not, then I live sola scriptura, and I will not change a single precept unless it is given by the Word of God alone. And so hopefully this starts to paint a picture of the Hegelian dialectic that we're dealing with, and in the next episode we're going to tackle the evangelical view of the end-time events and how it plays so much of a role in, in the focus on Israel and Jerusalem today. And I wanted to just say, this program, we're supported by donations. So if you'd like to support us doing Truth Matters and all of our other projects and amazing discoveries, please support so that we can continue to be bringing these messages to the world because we can't do it without your support. Please like, share, and subscribe. Share the video with your friends, your family, people that you think uh, in, in group pages on any way that you can share this information so that people can start waking up and really seeing the events that are taking place in our world today. Yeah, and we've literally never asked for donations once on this program. We're not interested in just collecting money. But if you feel like you've been impacted by the stuff we've shared, if you think other people can come closer to Jesus by understanding the truth, maybe they don't even believe in the Bible or believe any of this stuff is happening and this can help, just give a little bit of, of your money to help us continue to do this work. Because without that, we just won't won't continue, we, and we can't share. So you know, we we we're an organization that goes, as you said, off of donations. And so, if you feel if even 10, 15 percent of our audience became monthly donors, it would have an incredible impact in Absolutely. continuing and growing uh, the reach that we're able to share. So, uh, hopefully, people can appreciate that. You know, we we don't care about the money; we care about sharing the message. But we can't do it without the resources yes. to do so. And. We have a lot of other resources too, maybe that people don't know about. We have bookmarks, we have sharing cards, we have sharing DVDs. Go take a look at it, contact us. Let us know how you like the programs. Go contact our office, ask for these uh, sharing bookmarks. We have Bible studies on bookmarks that you can keep with you, walk around sharing cards for Truth Matters. We have sharing cards for a lot of our other programs mm -hmm. so that you can be involved in getting the message to the entire world because that's what the command was from Jesus yep. that we need to get this message to the entire world. Yep. So thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the next Truth Matters. Mm -hmm.